Good morning, church family. Happy Sunday. It's wonderful to uh, be here and and have the privilege to bring God's word to you again on another Sunday, even though uh, we're divided and uh, we're not necessarily together. Uh, It is nice to be able to have this sort of medium and uh, to still be able to preach to you and uh, and to get your feedback and all that kind of stuff. I've I've really appreciated uh, just those who have reached out, those who have sent words of encouragement, those who have let us know that they're praying for us. Um, I really appreciate those who joined us for prayer last Sunday evening. Uh, Tonight, I hope that you'll join us again at 7 o'clock on Facebook as uh, Grant Van Brimmer brings us uh, the word in our series, Just Jesus, uh, that he would have brought had they been able to make their trip. So that's tonight, Facebook Live at 7 p.m. But it's Sunday morning to uh, this morning. And uh, we just want to say thanks so much for hanging in there with us. I know this is a little bit strange, but uh, we've been very, very encouraged in the amount uh, that people have continued to give. Uh, We've been very encouraged with the amount that people have been engaging with these posts. And I just want to start off by by sharing with you, I had a couple church members who last week uh, just took an opportunity to hit the share button on uh, on this as if you're watching on Facebook, on Facebook Live. And uh, and what's so cool about that is that they said that they had several friends and family who uh, wouldn't have otherwise taken in a sermon on Sunday morning uh, who took it in because they hit share and it showed up on their live feed. And, uh, and so that just reminds me that, uh, you know, we, we, we preach all the time that God is sovereign, uh, which means God is up to something even during this, this strange time of kind of disembodied church gatherings. And uh, there's a lot more gospel content and sermons and church material online now than there was just a few short weeks ago. And so maybe one of the things that God is up to is using all of the uh, social media waves, all of the internet uh, material that's being pumped out. Uh, as a means of reaching people who would never step foot inside the doors of our church. So I would just encourage you, take a minute, hit that like button, go onto our Facebook page and, uh, and invite your friends to like the page so that they see these videos when they come up and hopefully there'll be uh, a, a change of pace from some of the doom and gloom that's still going out there on social media. But uh, I've been proud of, of you as a church. So many of you are using uh, int- uh, the, the internet and social media as a means to glorify God during this time. And uh, I just long for the day that we can come back together and, and meet once again as God's family, as, as, a, as a church family, and, uh, and we can be done with all of these uh, cameras and lights. But for now, this is what we have, and I'm looking forward to preaching to you. Uh, make sure, once again, that you say thanks to, uh, to Dave Wetlaufer for uh, letting us use his studio, letting us use his time, and, uh, and to his wonderful wife, Joan, who lets him spend his afternoons with me every once in a while. So um, anyway, we are here. It is Palm Sunday, which means I'm going to be preaching on the triumphal entry. And uh, before we dig into the text, you can grab your Bibles or your device, whatever you're following along. On You can open them to Matthew 21, and, uh, and as you do that, I'm going to pray for our time this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, just the privilege that it is to live in the period of history that we live in, where in the midst of an outbreak, and these aren't new, they've been happening throughout history, uh, but in the midst of an outbreak, we have the, the uh, opportunity to stay home, but to still have so many resources at our fingertips. We can um, we can order food, and we can uh, surf the internet, and we can um, uh, call one another, we can text one another, we can, we can see each other's faces through so much of this online technology. And so I thank you for that. And I pray more and more that you would help us to stay connected as a church family, help us to be connected to those that we share the most in common with, the blood of Jesus uh, during this time. I pray that now as we open up your word together, that even though this isn't the Sunday that we are used to, uh, whatever, wherever the kids are, are distracting us, whatever distractions there are in our homes, I pray that we would just tune into you and tune into your spirit, that you would have our full attention. I pray that you would help me to articulate well everything you've laid on my heart this week to share. I pray that your spirit would be here empowering the words that I speak and helping us to hear and to understand and to apply them to our very lives. I pray that, uh, that your word would speak to us this morning and, uh, and that uh, whatever it is that we need, whether it be encouragement or rebuke or edification or correction, I pray that it would come from your word this morning. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing to you, our God and our rock. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. So, Matthew 21, uh, preaching in, uh, uh, through this, this Palm Sunday, and, uh, and this is a familiar scene to you, and, and so I, I kind of wanted to frame this sermon around uh, kind of three things, okay? 
uh, a story, a scene, and a question. And those are the three things that I'm going to kind of focus this sermon on, a, a story, a scene, and a question. So before we get to the scene, which is this, this triumphal entry, this Jesus entering Jerusalem uh, a week before he's, uh, really a, a few days before he's going to be killed, but a week before Resurrection Sunday, a week before what we now call Easter Sunday. And he rides into Jerusalem, and if you read the gospel accounts, um, there's this really interesting verse in Luke when um, partway through Jesus' ministry near the end of his life, it says that he set his face toward Jerusalem, and the rest of his life really, because he would die in Jerusalem, became about his mission and his ministry moving towards and heading towards Jerusalem where he knew he was going to lay his life down as a ransom for many. And so here he is, he's coming into Jerusalem. The disciples rebuke him, his brothers brothers rebuke him saying, if he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to die. And yet here Jesus goes uh, courageously um, to the place where he would uh, die. But before we get to the scene, which is familiar to us, and I hope to maybe show you some things that maybe we've missed in our years of knowing this story, I want to start with a different story. Uh, It's it's the story of Robin Hood, and uh, and I don't know what your relationship is with Robin Hood. If uh, the second I hear Robin Hood, I think of the Kevin Costner Prince of Thieves movie because I loved that movie when I was a kid. Um, But when I was even younger, it was the uh, it was the Disney Robin Hood where Robin Hood's a fox and him and Little John and all that. Um, or maybe maybe you're a more of a men in tights kind of person, <laughs> or maybe you like the maybe you like the new one with um, uh, well with that other guy. Um, but whatever rendition of Robin Hood you like, I want you to think about Robin Hood for a minute. So, what happens in Robin Hood is it's the time of the Crusades, and King Richard is off fighting the Crusades with his knights, with his his standing army. And so the uh, Prince John, who is sort of heir to the throne uh, in, in, in the story, uh, he uses King Richard's absence as an opportunity to seize as much power as he can for himself while the king is away. And the Sheriff of Nottingham, of course, is, is kind of his right-hand man who collects taxes as he continues to tax the people to amass an army and to amass riches to eventually overthrow King Richard is kind of the, the, the plot point, is the, the, the hope. And Robin Hood enters the story as the sort of uh, vigilante thief who robs from the rich to give to the poor. And uh, I, have all, I could go on a long tirade about how I think, you know, um, put, looking at Robin Hood as a hero is what's caused so many of us uh, around this age who grew up on Robin Hood stories to love socialism so much. But um, that aside, uh, Robin Hood is a great character. Um, but what's interesting is that if, if, whether you're talking about the Prince of Thieves version or you're talking about the... Um, the Disney uh, version or, or most of the, the ways this story goes is at the end of the story, after kind of the Sheriff of Nottingham and Prince John are, are somehow defeated in some sort of way or at least gotten the better of by Robin Hood himself, King Richard returns to restore order to his kingdom. And, and so I want you to think about that. I just want you to think about that picture, that visual image of, of sort of King Richard. And in, the, uh, in the animated movie, King Richard is the lion, right, who comes home. And even in, uh, in the Kevin Costner film, um, it's, uh, it's Sean Connery, right, who comes back at the end. And he's got his accent and he's got his armor on. And he, he just looks like the powerful, demanding king. And he comes in right as, as uh, Robin Hood and Maid Marian are about to get married. And he comes in and every, every, the, the ceremony stops, the people stop stop. Uh, the eyes are no longer focused on the bride, and, and suddenly they, they move to the king as he enters. And there was this sense throughout all of the films, throughout all of the stories, that when King Richard returns, he would restore order. That all the bad guys would sort of uh, get their tail between their legs and run away because King Richard was this powerful man. And, and the, the boldness and the courage of Prince John was only present sort of in the absence, in the absence of the powerful king. So I, I want you to think about that because in a lot of ways, Jesus returning, coming to Jerusalem, God's city, the city where the throne of David sits, where the temple sits, the, the Jerusalem, kind of the centerpiece of so much of Israel's culture and history and, and worship and sacrificial system, all of it, they're, 
uh, it all kind of centers right there in Jerusalem. And so Jesus coming in is like the king returning to his throne, returning to his kingdom, returning to his city to restore order to what has been um, kind of decimated, what has been uh, taken advantage of. Um, and you have the, the, the uh, scribes and the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin who have, who have taken Jerusalem and, and kind of used it for their own gain and used it for their own ploys and, and the city is in disrepair. And we, we'll see that as we see Jesus go into the temple and cleanse it. So I want you to have that story in your mind as we, as we now move on to the scene. And the scene uh, comes from Matthew chapter 21. So here's the word of the Lord to us this morning, Matthew chapter 21, and I'm going to read to um, the end of verse 17. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written that my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it into a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him with the, uh, in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. So you have Jesus uh, come into the city, and you have this, this great scene. Now, one of the things you often hear in, uh, on Palm Sunday services, or maybe it's, they save it for the Good Friday service, is that you know, this crowd that is there ready to shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the, the son of David, Hosanna to the highest. Um, that same crowd is a fickle crowd because just a few days later, they, they would be there yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And I don't think that's actually a justified criticism. Um, And the reason I don't think so is because if you look at the narrative surrounding Jesus' arrest and trial and crucifixion, um, it happened in such a short and quick span and through the night that most of the people of Jerusalem would have been sleeping during the entire arrest and trial. And so I, I think what you're instead seeing is you're seeing the divide that Jesus brings. You remember that in the gospel accounts earlier, Jesus says to his disciples, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to divide. And I think what you see is as soon as the king returns to Jerusalem, there's a division, right? There's a division between those who accept, those who are there to greet the king, and those who are there to oppose the king. It's interesting because um, historically in uh, kind of uh, this time period, when a king was visiting the city, especially when the king was coming to a city to restore order, generally that meant that there was some sort of insurgence, there was some sort of rebellion that the king needed to come and squash. And what would often happen, this is actually where we get the, uh, the term rapture from. So uh, the, what, what has traditionally been thought of as the rapture of the church 
is sort of the uh, the um, the pulling the pulling out of the godly the godly people. Um, but if you read the passage, it's often associated with that. It's in First Corinthians chapter four. Um, it actually says that that um, those will be taken up with the Lord as He descends to the earth. And so that, that idea is that they, they go up and meet the Lord in the sky and then he, he doesn't reverse, you know, reverse trajectory and head back up with them, but he continues to descend and they descend with him. And the whole idea there, um, R.C. Sproul has a great teaching on this on Ligonier uh, Ministries website, but the whole idea there is that whenever a king would come to the city, especially to, to um, put down a rebellion, all of those who were loyal to the king would leave the city as he was arriving, to show their allegiance to him so that they could enter the city showing their support of the king. And so what's happening in this scene is that those who are uh, allied to the king, those who are looking to Jesus to come and to restore order to Jerusalem, understanding that, that he's the long-awaited Messiah, they come out to show their allegiance to the arriving king. And you have to remember that throughout the gospel accounts, there's, a, there's a one account of Jesus where he feeds, it says that he feeds the 5,000 men, likely a crowd of you know, 15 or 20,000 because it only records the men in that story and they would have been with their wives and children. So when Jesus feeds those multitudes with the fish and the loaves, it says afterwards that they tried to take him and force him to be their king. And this happens a couple times throughout Jesus' ministry. So, so the idea that the people wanted Jesus to be their king is well documented throughout the gospel accounts. And so here he is arriving to the king's city where the king's throne is, where the king's temple is, and, and the people come out to greet him to show allegiance to the king. There's a, there's a quote by Tim Keller that I think is really interesting. Um, it's, uh, it's in one of his books, and, and he calls this the, the satire of the triumphal entry. He says, on the one hand, this looks like all other triumphal entries. 200 years earlier, Simon Maccabeus had defeated foreign armies and kept Israel independent, and he rode into Jerusalem with the people shouting cheers and waving palm branches because he had delivered them. This triumphal entry parodies the entries of kings and armies. So, so what um, Tim Keller is saying is that this is not an unfamiliar scene in the early, in the first century. When a, when a king or a conquering general would come back into a city after conquering, this is what it would look like. They would ride in and there'd be palm branches being waved. There'd be people shouting. There'd be, there'd be rejoicing. There'd be a, there'd be a triumphal party. Tim Keller goes on to say, this triumphal entry parodies the entries of kings and armies. Victors in battle, however, do not ride into the capital cities riding on asses, but on fearsome horses. But this kind does and will not triumph through force of arms. So what he says is, is there's, there's similarities and there's differences to the way Jesus comes into uh, this, this sort of victory parade coming into the city. And one of the, one of the uh, similarities is the waving of palm branches, the laying down of coats, the shouting, the rejoicing. Uh, Hosanna is, uh, is a, a, a phrase, it's a Hebrew word that means save us or deliver us. And so when a conquering general or a, a king would be returning who's delivered them from their enemies, they would, um, they would, they would shout this, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king or Hosanna to um, the, the general or whoever it was. So in, in a lot of ways, it looks a lot like every other triumphal entry, but it looks a little different too because generally they're coming back on their war horses, on their steeds, not on donkeys. And so there's humility here with Jesus. There's a meekness to Jesus that, that sort of turns this scene on its head. It, what, what I want you to see is that the triumphal entry is, is a well-scripted event that was planned in the Old Testament, okay? Um, there's, there's biblical support for why the people are, are chanting what they're chanting. There's biblical support for why they lay their coats down, why they wave palm branches, why Jesus is, is riding on a donkey, uh, why the children are shouting. There's th- this is a well-scripted scene that's there. In fact, uh, Matthew, our author, says... Um, when, uh, when Jesus tells them to go and get a donkey. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. And then he uses, uh, and then, he, and then he, he quotes there from Zechariah. And so you have this idea that um, all of this is taking place because the Old Testament has scripted this moment in history. It had, it, had, it, had, it had prepared the way for what this moment was going to look like when the king arrives to take his throne. 
But there's these little hints. There's, there's, there's a donkey. And, and these are, this is not a, a military leader in military garb, but this is a humble man whose, uh, uh, Isaiah says, whose stature and whose esteem and whose physical appearance um, doesn't warrant any sort of praise. And so there's this, there's this other side of it here where it's, there's this conquering king, but he doesn't look like a conquering king. And, and Tim Keller is, is suggesting, and I would agree with him, that part of the reason for that discrepancy is to, to foreshadow the fact that this king will take his throne in an unexpected and a different sort of way, in a humble way. So when you look at this scene and you ask all of the whys in this passage, you know, why the donkey? Because of the Bible. Why the temple destruction? Because of the Bible. Why are the children hollering? Because of the Bible. Why are they saying Hosanna? Because of the Bible. Why are there palm branches? Because of the Bible. This is a well-scripted scene from the Old Testament that's, that's culminating and fulfilling right here in this scene. So I, first of all, let's, let's talk about the donkey. Go to Zechariah chapter 9 in your Bibles. And in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. I want you to hold that. I want you to hold that in your mind. He shall speak peace to the nations and his rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So Zechariah was prophesying a day when the king who brings salvation would enter into Jerusalem riding on a donkey and when they see that sign, when they see the sign of the, the king riding into um, the, the city, and, and, and trust me, throughout history, kings and generals had ridden back into Jerusalem. Uh, like I said, uh, Maccabeus, just 200 years prior to this, rode back into Jerusalem um, look at, looked at as a, as a sal, uh, savior of some kind, bringing salvation because he had just delivered the kingdom. But he didn't come in on, on a donkey and he didn't come in in all the same ways that Jesus did. And the reason he didn't was because Jesus was the king who was gonna ride in in this way. He was gonna be the one who would have real salvation. He was the one who's going to speak peace to the nations and he would be the one who would rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. He is the long awaited Messiah. So the, 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 the donkey's uh, piece in the story is, is part of the whole thing. And you can think about leaders and you can think about conquerors and you can think about kings in, in uh, years past who, who just wouldn't be able to humble themselves and ride in on a donkey. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know everything. I don't know a whole lot about the first century, but I can tell you that people's ideas of donkeys have not changed. The, the physical look of donkeys haven't changed. They're not the, the, uh, the sort of um, demanding of respect sort of animals that these giant war horses are. And so Jesus meekly, humbly comes into the city waiting for his triumphal entry, not coming on a war horse, but coming instead on a donkey. Uh, how about the cloaks? Well, if you go to 2 Kings chapter 13, 2 Kings chapter 13, it'll answer the question for why the, uh, ki- the, the people laid their cloaks on the ground. And it's just this, this uh, quick little story in 2 Kings chapter 9, and I won't go through the whole thing, but in, in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 3, 13, it says, Then in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps, and they blew their trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. So there's this, there's this scene in 2 Kings chapter 9 where uh, the men of Israel, right as Jehu was about to be crowned king, um, took their cloaks off and laid them under his feet and, and used that as this sort of impromptu, uh, spontaneous 
coronation ceremony calling Jehu is king, Jehu is king. And when you think about what Jehu did, we might initially think that Jehu was a particularly violent king, and he was. The Bible doesn't look back too kindly on Jehu, except that he began well. And one of the things that Jehu is known for was that it was him who destroyed wicked queen Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, who led Israel astray and tried to kill the prophet Elijah. And so Christ coming into Jerusalem is essentially kind of doing the same thing. He is overthrowing the wicked king, destroying the evil king so that he can take the throne. So that's one of the the, um, biblical significances of the cloaks. Well, what about the palms? What about the palm trees? Go to uh, Psalm 118, and there's a couple places, I think, for the palm branches. In Psalm 118, which is uh, uh, one of the Psalms of David, and it's a uh, psalm about the, uh, the, the love of God enduring forever. And near the end of the psalm, in verse 25, it says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. And then listen to the words. These are the, this is the exact uh, psalm that the people are quoting as Jesus comes into the city. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God. He has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal of sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. So that verse, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is preceded by verse 25, save us we pray, O Lord. Well, the Hebrew word there is Hosanna. It, we translated in the psalm, save us, but that's what that cry is. Hosanna means save us or deliver us. It's a cry out for salvation. And so this could read, Hosanna, we pray. Hosanna, O Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is exactly what they're, they're shouting as Jesus comes in. And so this is a messianic psalm talking about the steadfast love of God, which will endure forever and comes in the person of Jesus Christ, who would be the salvation who would be the answer to the cries for saving, who would be the savior who comes into the city. The other other thing that I I find interesting about the uh, the palm branches is that it's actually only uh, John's gospel. So this, this triumphal entry is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it's only in John's gospel that it's actually told, told to us that they're palm branches. In the other ones, they just say branches or, or tree branches. But in uh, John's gospel, he's the one who specifically tells us that these are palm branches, which I think, and that's in John chapter 12, verse 13, which I find interesting because it's John who writes In the book of Revelation, this is Revelation chapter 7, after this I looked up and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and all peoples standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so you have this connection where John makes it uh, obvious. He he inserts this detail under divine inspiration that it's a palm branch because, because under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he would then later on in his life see a vision in the throne room of all of the saints that, that, that cannot be counted who would be holding these palm branches talking about how salvation belongs to the Lamb. Jesus, who is the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world, rode into uh, Jerusalem with palm branches being laid down as people declared to him to be the Lord of salvation. Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, O Savior. And then he would come in, lay his life down in Jerusalem to purchase all of those saints that John would later see in a vision holding palm branches saying, worthy is the lamb. It's amazing to me. And then if you think about um, Leviticus chapter 23, this is the other place in scripture where these palm branches show up. Um, uh, it, It takes us back to the Feast of Booths. 
And the Feast of Booths, just so that you understand, was a feast that was designated to remind Israel that God had saved them from slavery and brought them out of Egypt during the Exodus. And so every observance of the Feast of Booths, the people would take, and this is a quote from Leviticus chapter 23, take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And so there's this, this um, command by God as, you're observing the, the, as they were observing the Feast of Booths that they would take these palm branches and use them in their worship towards God to commemorate when God brought them out of Egypt and saved them. And so here's Jesus coming into Jerusalem to do what? To save his people from slavery to sin and to set them free. Right? He was the real Passover lamb. He was the real savior who would um, take all of the the types and the shadows of the Exodus and and, uh, and do it once and for all spiritually for us, um, saving us from sin. So you have these deeply significant symbols in the story, the palm branches, the cloaks, the donkey. And I just want to go back to the donkey one more time. And I want you to go to, to Genesis this time. Genesis chapter 49, verses 10 and 11. And for any of our people in our church, these verses will be familiar to you. We talk about them a lot. We've talked about them uh, a lot last year when we were going through the big story because I think this is one of the biggest messianic promises um, that we ought to hold on to. But in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10 is the, is the, uh, um, the familiar one. So this is when Jacob whose name was changed to Israel. Um, this is after Joseph becomes second to command in, in Egypt and his people have been saved. And Jacob, his father and the father of his 11 brothers was dying. And in his dying moments, he, he, he gives a blessing to each one of his sons. And the blessing that he gives to Judah uh, begins in, in chapter 49, but it kind of culminates to verse 10 where it says, the scepter shall not per- depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So the reason this is a messianic promise is because Jesus, who is from the tribe of Judah, Jesus, who was the messianic king who would have the obedience of the nations, um, this promise is that out of Judah will come a ruler who will have the obedience of the people. Right? The, the ruling scepter shall not depart from Judah's hands, right? from the tribe of Judah. And remember that the, um, this, was, this was fulfilled when Ephraim was the ruling tribe of Israel, which got passed to Judah for King David's line. And, uh, and so Judah becomes the tribe that would rule, and not just rule Israel, but here it says, until the, the nations obey him. Okay, so that's interesting, right? That's one of those messianic promises we talk about quite a bit. But look at verse 11. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and has vesture in the blood of grapes. And so you have this this messianic promise that that is attached to a symbol. And the the symbol, okay, so the promise is that Judah would rule, the the tribe of Judah. Jesus, who is a uh, a descendant of David in the kingly line of David from the tribe of Judah, who is now entering Jerusalem to claim his throne, comes in on a donkey. And so this, this promise, this messianic promise by Jacob to his son Judah that one day a ruler would come from his loins who would have the obedience of the nations and that promise is attached to a symbol and Jesus fulfills that symbol as he rides in on his donkey. It's, this is a, a, a scene that is just so ripe for those who are steeped in the Bible that they would see this and if they could think about all these things converging in this moment that the king has come back who, to restore order to his house and to his kingdom and to his nation and to his world. But he's gonna come in, not on a war horse ready to do battle, but on a donkey ready to lay his life down for many. It's an amazing, an amazing scene. But that begs a question. So we've looked at the story of Robin Hood and King Richard returning. We've looked at the scene of the, uh, of the triumphal entry, which is, as I said, familiar to many of us. And then you have this question that should come to our minds. 
And that question is, if the triumphal entry is meant to mirror all of the victory parades of previous generals and kings who had come back to Jerusalem after a battle and after the victory had been won, then what is Jesus doing throwing a victory parade before the victory is won? Right? I mean, so here he comes into Jerusalem and he's still days away from the crucifixion, still a week away from the resurrection, still a week and 40 days from the ascension and the session at the right hand of the Father. All of those things hadn't happened yet. And here's Jesus throwing a victory parade before the victory has been won. So how can Jesus take part in this this victory parade before the victory had taken place? I think the answer to that question also becomes our big idea for the day, and that is Jesus celebrated victory before it had been accomplished because he had faith in the promises of God. I want to say that again. Jesus celebrated victory before it had been accomplished because he had faith in the promises of God. Sometimes when we read the Bible, we get caught in this really... um, uh, I think, unhelpful frame of mind where we know how the story ends. We know the last chapter. We know what comes after this. We know that Jesus dies on the cross. We know that he's resurrected three days later. We know that he ascends to sit at the right hand of the Father, that there he sits making intercession for us, sitting at the right hand of the Father until all of his enemies are placed underneath his feet in victory. We know all that because we read the rest of the Bible. Jesus didn't have that luxury. And I know, I, know, I know you're going to say, well, he was God in the flesh. And yeah, Yes, of course, all of that is true. But don't you know that it's significant that he spent 33 years on earth? You know as well as I do that you have seen miracles. You have seen the greatest of which, if you belong to Jesus Christ, if you are in him, the greatest miracle that you, will ever, that you have seen or ever will see is your own salvation. God shining gospel light into a dark heart, God taking out your heart of stone and putting in a heart of flesh, God forgiving you of all your sins and calling you a new creation. But how many of you know that somewhere between that moment in your life, whenever that was, and now there's, there's been some, some loss of, of faith? I mean, you've, you've gained Bible knowledge and you've, you've gained understanding of the story, but there's, there's a sort of realness to your conversion, realness to your experience with God, a realness to your faith that you, without a question, you know that God loved you and has purpose for your life. And, and many of you wept tears when he converted you and all of those things. And somehow life has a way of kind of washing those things away. We get into routines and we, we do life and you know, we, we, we go to work and we clock in and we clock out. Maybe not so much these days, but that's normally what we do. And, and some of the excitement and some of the, the genuine enthusiasm of conversion and joy of our salvation gets lost in the everyday mundanity of our lives. And so Jesus lived for 33 years on this earth. He saw good and he saw bad. His cousin John the Baptist was beheaded while Jesus was alive. Right, he had his own uh, one of his own disciples that he spent three years with stabs him in the back and hands him over. Right, he knew what it meant to be hungry and thirsty and tired, and and uh, uh, he knew what it was like to be in a boat in the middle of a lake with uh, with a storm going on. I mean, Jesus experienced all of those difficult things that we experience in life, and and none of those experiences washed away his faith that when God says something, God is going to come through with it. So so the reason Jesus could participate in this sort of pre-victory parade was because he knew that the battle, the victory, was actually secure. He knew that even though victory hadn't been accomplished yet because he hadn't gone to the cross, he hadn't been resurrected, he hadn't ascended, and he hadn't sat at the right hand of the Father, he knew all of that was inevitable because he trusted the promises of God. And so what, what's so amazing to me, and this is something that I saw this week as I studied the story and prayed through it and, and, and meditated on it, is that Jesus is displaying an unbelievable amount of faith in this story. And sometimes we don't think about Jesus as, as having to live in faith, right? That Jesus went to the cross trusting in God, right? Trusting that God would raise him from the dead trusting that this was going to accomplish all that it had accomplished. And yes, of course, I know, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, uh, part, part of the Godhead, I, I, I know all of that. 
But here's Jesus about to endure the most difficult thing a human being has ever undergone. Taking the curse of sin for all of us on himself. Standing in our place and enduring the wrath of God towards sin. He knew he was going to have to endure that. And he went to the cross in faith, trusting God that God was going to not only raise him, but use this act of obedience for world transformation. He had to trust that this act was going to be the victory that they had planned it to be. And so Jesus goes to the cross in faith. And I think that's such a relevant word for us right now. We live in a time when the promises of God seem to be thrown into question in a lot of ways. When, when we think about God's promise to, keep, uh, to, to be with us, to not leave us, to not forsake us, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, some of these promises, right now during these difficult times as, as COVID-19 kind of not only um, spreads around the world, but the fear of it spreads around the world and the, um, the economic backlash to the measures that we've taken is, is sure to stay with us for months and years to come. There are people who are losing their jobs. There are people who are losing their retirement. There are people who are losing family members. There are people who are losing a lot right now. And right now is one of those times where we are looking ahead to something, knowing what God has promised, that he works all things together for good, being one of them. And we're finding it hard to trust. Well, just be encouraged by this story. When your Savior went into the city where he knew he was going to lay his life down as a ransom for many, trusting God that God would use that as a means for winning the world, as a means for glorifying his son. God had to trust that that was true. Sometimes we, we think about the promises of God and uh, we have trouble believing them because we don't see the fulfillment of them. And this is what I mean when I say that Jesus had to go to the cross in faith because he could only see in faith. And if you look at Hebrews 11 and 12, where it talks about faith being the evidence of things unseen, it talks about how Abraham and so many of our heroes of the faith had to look ahead and they never saw the fulfillment of the thing that they hoped for. They never actually saw it fulfilled. And, and yet God asked them to act in obedience. Abraham never saw his children become a mighty nation, but he trusted that promise of God. He never saw the fulfillment that through him all the families of the earth would be blessed. We're only starting to see that fulfillment in our lifetime. And there's many, many more years for God's blessing to reach the rest of the nations. So what are some of the promises of God that we have trouble believing? Let me just read a few of them to you. Psalm 118 verse 6 says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. Isaiah 40 verse 29 says, He gives power to the faint, and to him who has might, he increases strength. Isaiah 41 verse 13, for I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand and it is I who say to you, fear not, I am the one who helps you. James 1 verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Numbers 14, verses 21 and 22, the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Revelation 14, verse 11, as I, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess that I am God. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Ezekiel 36, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you should be clean from all of your uncleanliness, and from all of your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will put within you a new spirit, and I will 
remove from the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to obey my statutes. And you shall be my people and I will be your God and I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness. Philippians 1 verse 6, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. John chapter 10 verses 27 to 29, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and not one will be snatched out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and none is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Philippians chapter four, verses six and seven. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. Or Genesis chapter 22, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and the sand of the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. These are just some of the many promises of God in scripture. And if we lived every single day knowing that these promises were true, I think our lives would look drastically different. We wouldn't be caught up in the fear and the panic that's going on in the world right now. We wouldn't be stuck in despair and despondency because we would know that these promises are true. And it would cause us to be bold and courageous, just like Jesus who marched into Jerusalem into certain death, knowing there he was going to lay his life down as a ransom for many. But he went anyway because he knew the promises of God and he had faith that the promises of God were going to be completed. If we lived our lives knowing that all of these and all of the other glorious promises of scripture were true, it would drastically change the way we see our lives and the way we live our lives. It would drastically change our families and our neighborhoods and our communities and our church. And so my encouragement to you today is to be like Jesus. The, the whole purpose of God's work in you, right there when it says uh, in Romans eight twenty eight that uh, he works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes, it goes on to talk about our predestination in Christ to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That God's purpose in all of this is that when we behold Christ, when we look at Christ, this is 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 and 4, that when we look at Christ, when we behold Christ, and that's what we're doing right now, we're looking at him in this scene, in this triumphal entry, and the faith which, which, with which he marched into Jerusalem, into his death, knowing and trusting the promises of God. When we behold that, when we see that, we are conformed to the image of his likeness. We become like him, we become bold like him, we become courageous like him, and we become like him in the ability to trust that the promises of God will be fulfilled. I think if the church lived like they trusted the promises of God were true, then what's said of Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 17 would be true of the church today, and that is that we turn the world upside down with their teaching. We are called to go and make disciples, not because we have any power in and of ourselves to convert other people, but because God has made promises about what he will do through his church. He's also made promises about his sovereignty. Uh, Ephesians chapter one, verse 11 says that he works all things according to the counsel of his own will that our God is in the heavens and he does all that he pleases, which means that we are in a sovereign moment in history that God ordained before the foundation of the world. And he also ordained that you and I would live during this time to see the promises of God fulfilled. COVID-19 has not delayed anything. COVID-19 has not changed anything. It's changed things from our day-to-day lives. It's changed uh, kind of uh, how we interact but it has not changed the plans and the purposes of God. It's always been a part of the plans and purposes of God. The question is, what is the purpose and do we trust God with the outcome? And are we willing to be a part of whatever he's doing during this time? Jesus rode into Jerusalem. It was a glorious, wonderful scene, but the victory had not been won yet. Jesus looked ahead to the victory in faith. Let us stand in the midst of this 
looking ahead to the promised victory, knowing that God's purposes will be fulfilled, and knowing that we're called to be a part of bringing about his purposes on the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that you are a good God and that you are a sovereign God. We thank you, Lord, that your purposes and your plans are absolute. We thank you, Lord, that nothing is a surprise to you. And so, Lord, we pray that with the same faith Jesus marched into Jerusalem with, that we would live our lives boldly, knowing that your plans and your purposes cannot be thwarted. May we search your scriptures for all of the promises that, uh, that you've made to us, and may we, we hold them in our mind's eye, and may by your spirit you give us the faith to believe that they're true and to live like they're true so that we can celebrate victory, celebrate victory, even before it's been completely realized. We thank you that the knockout blow has been rendered, that Jesus won on Calvary, and now we're just seeing the outworkings of that victory in history. I pray that in this week to come, which is going to be a very different sort of Easter week, I pray, Lord, that we would be able to celebrate like victors, celebrate like those who have faith that the victory has been won. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, as you go this week, I just want you to know the, the videos that we're going to put out on Facebook and YouTube over the next couple of days are going to actually kind of walk your way through the last week of Jesus. So today is Sunday and we're celebrating Palm Sunday because that's when he did his triumphal entry. And then Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, we're going to lead you through to Thursday night when Jesus gets arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. So those are the videos that we're going to put out over this week. And, uh, and my hope to you is that even though this is a different sort of Easter, that, uh, that you would be steeped in the scriptures, following um, the life of Jesus in his last few days, and that that would embolden you and encourage you and uh, connect you to your Savior in a, in a wonderful way, and, uh, and that it would equip you to live like victors, uh, to look ahead to the victory, so that on, on Easter Sunday next week, you can celebrate Easter as those who have faith that the victory will one day be completely done with. Uh, thank you. Thanks for watching. Love you. Miss you. And uh, we'll see you again next week.